when I'm reading the Bible, there's something in me that just, there's just a fire inside of me when I'm reading all of the Old Testament, especially, yeah. and the New. The uh, same thing happens to me when I'm reading the Apostles or reading the book of Revelation. I can't explain it, but as I'm reading, I'm seeing that God's Word is timeless. We're dealing with the same issues in the church today as what the prophets were dealing with among the children of Israel. Some people would call it anger, right? That's what they said on that one. Yeah, I, I noticed the, the comments. I'm not angry. You're passionate. I'm passionate, but I don't know why I raise my voice. I don't. I come to every videotaping saying to myself, Ted, don't raise your voice. Because it's hard on my voice. Yeah, you get passionate, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I notice Lori does it too. You know, there's something like that day when she said God would spit them out like the lukewarm things that they are. I could tell she was. Aren't you feeling what God would feel as you're reading the word of God? Well, I see it this way. God is looking and he's saying, hey, I sent you a man, my son, to show you who I am. And. I've given you everything possible to be able to see that. Mm -hmm. And you're rejecting it. Yes. I'm mad. Yes. He's done all that. The sacrifice that God has given to try to give us a chance. Oh, just feeling that. That all that God has done amazes me. Mm -hmm that people would ignore that and then claim that they actually believe in Jesus. Yeah. No, you don't believe in Jesus. Because if you believed in Jesus, you would believe in all of his words, in all of the words of his Father, in all of the words of the prophets. The prophets of God meaning, you know, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, they were all called prophets. When I read the prophets, I feel them. I feel what they're dealing with. I, I can so easily identify with all of them. I don't know why. Jeremiah says, I'm young. Moses says, I'm old. And God says, I don't care. I will give you the words to say. Yeah, and he does. All you have to do is read the words. My love for the words isn't just mentally interesting. That's, that's the key right there. It's not mentally in interesting. It is. It is spirit and is life. Yeah. I'm putting those words inside of me. So I'm reading the other day, and I come across the word brimstone, fire and brimstone. And my heart goes, hmm, let's look that up. But I'm, I'm not just mentally looking at this, because I see that this is a form of judgment. Brimstone. Someone else could be reading the Bible. And they just see brimstone. What is that? Well, it's partly sulfur. It's rock. And, and then you see these people online producing videos. We have found the site where Gomorrah was, Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? Oh, because we found sulfur and rock and it's so easily burned. And guys, 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 you're not again... You are trying to prove that the Bible is real. That's not faith. 
Faith actually reads the words of God and you put your faith in the words. That's the key. It's more real to me than what you're finding on the ground. Because that word that you're reading is eternal. <laughs> I'm looking at the word brimstone and I look at it and it's fire from heaven. And then wherever I read, it's also what comes out of the mouth of the saints. You know, we're filled with the Spirit of God, and and sometimes people wonder, why do you raise your voice? Why is this man angry? Well, it's sort of the same feeling. When you watch a bully pick on someone helpless, what happens inside of you? Even though you know you can't do anything about it. What happens inside? You wish that you could or somebody could give him his due recompense. Because that's what recompense means. It's to pay what you've got coming. That's it. And that's how I feel. I just can't help it. When I'm reading the prophetic word of God, my heart cries for the person that's being picked on. That's how I see all leaders today. The bigger they are, the bigger bullies they are. That's how I see it. I'm sorry. There are times... When I'm reading the Bible and I just start thinking about Kenneth Copeland and I just... Oh, your time is coming, buddy. And then people think, oh, well, we'll just, you know, we'll pick on those guys in the word of faith circles. No, I see the same thing in all the leaders on the other side, too. All the evangelical bullies. I see them too. They've turned the word of God into a whip. Not a sword. A sword is supposed to be able to kill flesh. But they dare not use it as a sword because then they would have to kill their own flesh. Yeah. Just like I have. It's what I describe it as. You know, the Word of God is a sword, and it wants to kill flesh. That's what it's made for. That's why you keep it sharp. Because now I know what fleshly teaching, how it manifests. It really does. It manifests as control and bullies. Yes. Spiritual bullies. So when you read... Like the book of Ezekiel, he describes the shepherds who are not feeding the people, not feeding the sheep, but living off of them. Yeah. How could you not be angry if you actually care? How could you? I don't get it. And then people get angry at me for raising my voice. Well, you're doing the same thing, my goodness. But you see, you're actually angry that I'm, I'm st stepping on your flesh and stabbing your flesh and saying you've got a wrong concept of God. And I don't like it. I don't like when you call God names. I see God as he is. I do not like it when preachers claim that God orchestrates evil. I don't see evil in God at all. He is not the creator of evil or the source of evil. So people say, where did evil come from? Keep from you! How dare you ask that question? Right? Yeah. Where did evil come from? Are you trying to say that God gave the evil? Wow. No. I know. The woman that you gave me. Yeah. 
<laughs> the woman that you gave me made me eat this. Oh, come on, Adam. You knew. The Bible actually says she was deceived. You weren't. You took a part of that. Sure. That's rebellion. And then you're going to blame God? God gave me the rebellion in my heart? Oh, my goodness. See, God, even God, uh, these people that say, well, you know, they'll quote things like, the Lord lives in heaven and he does what he pleases. And you're going to tell me that God pleases to be a bully? Because that's actually what you're saying. I... You see, my mind, uh, I don't have just a few scriptures that are favorites. My mind is all over the Bible thinking how reluctant God is to judge. He says over and over, e even in the book of Ezekiel, I'm reluctant to judge the wicked, but I have to because I've given you my word. It's no pleasure to me, he says. Nobody has to be fair, and he gives him so many chances. So, uh, I mean... He's so patient. He is so patient. Mm -hmm. And and we wonder, you know, does God kind of just... He puts up with a whole bunch of accusations, and then what? He just flips a switch and gets angry? No, he doesn't have a temper like that. Mm -hmm. The anger of the Lord is kindled... By us. Yeah, we keep stoking it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just keep poking him and keep poking him. Mm -hmm. And then wonder. I mean, if I were God, I would have dealt with you a long time ago. Thank goodness that I'm not God. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's it. We don't have... I don't have the patience he does. No. He spoke his word. He gave you his word as a promise. Don't we need that promise? You know, we need justice. Because God knows that there's going to be evil around us. So God said, okay, well, I'm going to judge the flesh. It really ticks me off when Christians preach like the world is theirs and they get upset they they use words like society you know we have to be an influence on society there's ungodly th concepts in society the lord did not say that the world is yours to change he told all of god's people it doesn't matter when it the time was. Noah, get out. Egypt, come on, children of Israel, get out. Lot, in that awful society, get out. And then the believers in the New Testament. No, I'm not sending you out to influence the society of the Roman Empire. I want you to come out and be separate. Do not love the world. We're all upset because society is becoming evil and selfish, like Sodom and Gomorrah. Quit trying to change it. Just come out. You're not going to change it. It's interesting because people use this, th this thought. We are to be the light of the world. We think that we're supposed to carry the light to the people in darkness. No, it's the other way around. I am the light of the world, Jesus said. Come to me. You see, the light is supposed to be like, you know, the concept of, uh, I was searching through the Bible, trying to understand the concept of Abraham, okay? Abraham, he's supposed to represent a father of a family. And the concept of a family 
in the Hebrew means the home fire is burning. There's a place to go to. But you see, from a long distance away, you're attracted to the home fires, the campfire, to get home so that you can rest. That's the idea of what a family is supposed to be. Okay? Now, where did we get the idea that we're supposed to pack up the tent and the fireplace and everything that home represents and take the home out into the wilderness to the lost? Where did we get that idea? Jesus said the light is like a city on a hill. What, do you move the city? Or does the city stay there and attract you to it? See, the same idea as the campfire at home. I can see the light from far off. It attracts me. Well, it's like Jesus. Everybody came to him. Mm -hmm. He didn't go to them. He didn't go That's right. running around after everybody. They came to him. They came to him. Because and when he did mm -hmm. uh, go to certain cities, mm -hmm. he was amazed. He said, they're not even interested. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to the next town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they rejected him. Yeah. He, he wasn't going to spend a whole bunch of time standing there arguing with them. Let's just go to the next town. That's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're either attracted to light or you're not attracted to light. You know what? Light, to some people, they're afraid of it. They're looking from the distance, looking at the campfire burning at home, thinking, oh, there's people there. I'm not going there. I belong out here, lost. I'm not attracted to the light. No. See what I'm saying? It depends on your heart. Mm -hmm. I remember where this all came from is because I'm reading in Exodus that God said to them, I'm going to make this month will become the first month of your year. Okay, this is the month you came out of Egypt. We will call it a bib. A B. How did I get on to Abraham? He starts with A B. Ab. We see it in the New Testament, quoted from a Hebrew word, our father, Abba. Okay? Ab. You've got the first month, Ab Eb. Abraham is the first father of faith, the first of many, the first of a nation, the father, the source. So you've got this, this concept of Ab. Our heavenly father is also Ab, Abba, our father. Now, don't be childish, like I see a lot of Christians saying, oh, it's like saying, Daddy. No, it's not like saying, Daddy. It's stronger than that. This is that concept of Ab. He's the head of the family. You're attracted to go home. That's where the home fires are burning. That's what you see in the distance, in the darkness. You, you can see that fire at the tent. That's my home. It's stronger than daddy. Now, that same thing is now applied to the first month. Abib. This is the month we came out of bondage. It became a people who would walk with God in the wilderness. <laughs> Strong language. We're going to go into a little bit of a Bible study, and you'll see what I mean by 
as I'm reading the Word of God, how it motivates me. So we're going to go to Exodus chapter 33, starting in verse 18, and then we're going to be all over two chapters, chapter 33 and chapter 34. And uh, we're going to start in verse 18, and it says, He said, that's Moses, Moses said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Now, in other translations, let's see. In the New King James Version, it says, And he said, Please show me your glory. So I looked this word up, I beseech thee, and it's a pleading. You're asking for something that normally you wouldn't be allowed to have. You're pleading for something that's special. You're not usually allowed to have this. It's very passionate and very earnest. It's an earnest cry. Mm -hmm. This isn't a, just a sideline. Oh, by the way, can I see your glory mm -hmm. while, while we're here? No, no, it's a... I'm pleading with you. I'm pleading. I'm begging. Every fiber of your being. You are. Everything within me. I want to see your glory. Now, the word glory, Mark and I were talking about this on the phone earlier. We've got two sources for the word glory. You've got the Hebrew concept, and then you have the Greek concept in the New Testament. Now, We'll deal with the New Testament first. The word glory comes from the word doxa, which means a shining, but not just light. It, the concept of the shining is all that, in the case of God, the shining is all that God is, everything that he is, all of his preferences, all of his desires, all of his plans, all that God is, is built into this concept of doxa. When he shines, he's showing you all that he is. Now, when you get into the Hebrew, it's almost the same thing, but it's not talking about light. In the Hebrew, it is the concept of the weight of all that you are. In other words, the weight, in the sense of weighing something of value, the weight, that's what Moses is pleading to see. He wants to see all that God is. So God says to him in the next verse, he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Now this is interesting because when you actually read in the next chapter, when God says, okay, I will show you my glory, but in order to show you my glory... I'm going to have to put you on a rock. Put you in the cleft in the rock. Cover you with my hand. Walk past you. And, and people are all getting excited. Oh, 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 Moses. Moses. He gets to see God. But, you see, he's really not getting to see with his physical eyes because that's not what this is about. It isn't about seeing God with your physical eyes. It's about seeing all that he is. So he tells him, I will cover you with my hand, and as I walk by... I will remove my hand, and you'll just see the my back parts. Now, this is not trying to say that, ooh, Moses got to see the back parts of God. No, it's the idea that God is saying, you 
can't see my face and live. So therefore, I'm going to protect you as much as I can. I'm going to put you on a rock. And that again, the, the concept of the rock is we have to be established on the rock, Christ Jesus, on the foundation on which the church would be built. That rock, that rock is a fortress. That's the safe place to be while we learn what the glory of God is. Because most of us, there's no way that we could handle seeing all that God is all at once. We would die just for the, the fear of His righteousness and how pure He is. All of God's prophets I'm sorry, I can't help it, but I love the prophets. There's something about reading the prophets I identify with. All the prophets felt the same way in the presence of God. Moses felt inadequate. Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips. Jeremiah said, I am young. I can't do the job you're asking me to do. All of them, all of the, the prophets. Daniel felt sick for days after seeing what God wanted to show him. I do not read any proud prophets of the Lord. They're reluctant to be prophets. And you may ask, well, why do you identify with all those men? I don't know why, but that's what made me say, I don't want to say anything to the church. For 30 years I stayed silent. I was a reluctant voice. For 30 years I kept saying, God, please, please, no, not me. Not me. I don't want to be a voice. That's how I identify with all those prophets. And to this day, I will not call myself a prophet. I won't call myself any kind of office. You know, the church teaches, you know, offices. No. You know what makes you what you are? By doing what you're supposed to do. It's that simple. You put the Word of God in your heart, and it literally burns its way out of you. You can't hold it in, no matter how you try. And it's like torture. It is. Because you keep reading it, and putting more and more and more and more in, every day. It was always meant to come out. It was always meant to come out. Mm -hmm. You can't cork it. No. You can't lock it in. You can't say to yourself, shut up, Ted. Mm -hmm. It's a living thing. It has to it's a living thing. Yeah. Yep. It's not going to stay still. It's going to come out. <laughs> you know, if I wanted to be useless to God you know what I could do to stop it I know exactly what I need to do stop reading mm -hmm. let it die who can who could do that and in your heart justify that mm -hmm. I know how to shut me up Take the Bible away from me. And even then, it would take years and years and years for it to subside. That's what I'm saying. I identify with all these prophets. And I don't know why. I just do. 
I love these guys. I love it. Because I can see the same heart cry. Moses is saying, I can't speak very well. Why, you want me to go talk? Pharaoh? Whoa. I've been running for him for 40 years. And you want me to go back there to to talk to, 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 to him? <laughs> Moses, he doesn't even know what he's asking, but he's... See, that's the thing about a real born-again Christian. You don't even know who God is. You just want to know Him. Yeah. Yeah. That's the true heart. The people that claim they already know everything there is wouldn't dare. Wouldn't dare ask God, show me your glory. Now keep in mind, God and Moses up to this point have had a long relationship. And now he asks. Because how much has he seen already? And now he's asking, show me your glory? I mean, my goodness. He saw him at the burning bush. He saw him deliver the children of Israel. He saw all the, the miracles and the plagues and the judgments. To set the people of God free. He saw the Red Sea divide. He saw the Red Sea come in over the armies of Egypt. He saw all of that. And here we are, well into the journey in the wilderness. This is just when they're coming into the land of Canaan. And now he says, show me your glory. Oh, I get it. See, the glory, the same glory that Moses saw was veiled in flesh and walked among us. And God sent his son so that his son would declare the glory of God. I like that word, declare. Because that's what God did. Mm -hmm. When Moses said, show me your glory, yeah. he spoke. Mm -hmm. God spoke. Again, that's where the glory comes from. That's why you need to read the word of God, because this is God spoke. God declared to you who he was. He said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. I will proclaim. Why? Because this is how God has chosen to manifest his glory. This is what he put in the prophets. This is what was in the heart of Christ. To proclaim the name of the Lord. And I get angry. Yes, I do. You get all these people on the internet now. They're trying to tell you that we're supposed to pronounce the name of the Lord a certain way. Or else we got it wrong. No, you're coming from the flesh. That is not the desire of God that you pronounce his name properly. It's you understand the character in the name. That's when you know the name. My goodness, the legalistic flesh just drives me crazy. That's what I was trying to explain to you a few weeks ago. When man gets involved, 
See what they're doing? Mm -hmm. They got their hand in there, and they're going to write out the name of the Lord and say, you have to pronounce it properly. I want to cut off your hand. Get your hand out of there. Because that is not your heart. That's you with your hand trying to get in there and write the word of God. With the hand of flesh. See, God does not desire that. He desires to take the word of God and write it on your heart. Then you'll wonder. Then you'll understand what I'm trying to say. You can't keep it in. There are things that, yes, they make you angry. It's not because of what they're saying about me. I could care less. But you start talking about my father in terms that I don't see in the word of God because I love the word of God. I, I see that God has proclaimed his name. I will be gracious. I will show mercy. Or the same God that's saying, I will be gracious, I will show you mercy, but you can't see my face. And then people say, well, Moses saw God face to face. No, that's not, it's not a physical sight. He went into the tabernacle to spend time with God, to talk face to face. That means voice to voice. Because scripture says no man has seen God. No man has seen God at any time. But his son has declared him. Yes. So he took him. And God said to him, Behold, there's a place by me. You will stand upon a rock. That's prophetic language. All of God's words are prophetic. Everything. It's alive to me. It shall come to pass, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft, or the cleft of the rock. I'm going to hide you. And I will cover you with my hand. I will pass by. And I will take away my hand. Did Moses just see the back parts of God's glory? No, the glory's not revealed yet. God's just walking by. When you go to the next chapters where you're going to see the glory, I'm going to go to Exodus chapter 34, verse 5. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there. See again? The cloud. Same concept of, I'll cover you with my hand. If I have conversations with you again, there'll be a cloud. Because you can't see my glory and live. But I want you to know my glory. I can only show you a little bit at a time. And it will be life to you. But I can't just show you all of it. And it says, the Lord passed by and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious and long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. You see that? That's the glory. How does it reveal itself? By God declaring by his word, I'm telling you, if you love the Word of God, you will love the words. All of these words are descriptive from God Himself. Do you see anywhere in this revelation that I will be a bully? I will cause accidents. I will trip you up every chance I get. 
I will test you. I will tempt you. And then wonder why I get angry when I listen to preachers. This is the revelation of God being shown to Moses. This is the glory of God. Now, there is a side of this, though. Watch this. Verse 7. I'm in his Exodus chapter 34, verse 7, if I've lost you. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. What? What's the switch for? No, we're just, we're, we're thinking, oh, it's all good until you say that. By no means clear the guilty. God is using language here. I will forgive you. I will show you graciousness, mercy, long-suffering, but it's going to be because you've got a heart for me just like Moses. Show me your glory. I want to know you as you are. Not as what men have been declaring about you for hundreds and hundreds of years. Well-established doctrines. There is no glory in the God that men have declared. No. I noticed it again because, you know, I I put together some shorts and I put them on YouTube. And the reaction is, wow. And what bothers me, people write and they'll say, okay, it's about God. And they'll say, well, the whole topic here is free will. And I thought to myself immediately, guys, it is not about you. Your free will is the most important thing? No. Get yourself out of the picture. It's about getting to know God. Do you have a heart like Moses? Show me your glory. I want to know you as you are. It's not about you having free will. Yeah, it's not about us staying as we are. God loves us the way we are. That's, that's baloney. No, God does not love you the way you are. He wants you to come to him and repent and change your mind and be transformed. By what? These living words. This is what you're meant to live by. These living words. Every word. This will not only give you an understanding of who God is, it will also give you an understanding of the heart of Moses, the heart of the prophets, the heart of all those people that were, that were reluctant to speak for God. Yet, then you'll understand, yeah, I, I feel the same way, I feel reluctant, but the more word that I put inside of me, I know I just can't hold it back. I will look for any opportunity I can. God is full of forgiveness, but it's not free. It comes because you repent. You come to God and say, God, I'm sorry for the things that I've said about you. I'm actually sorry for the things I've heard about you and believed it. I may not have said those words myself, but listen, the accusations that men gave you from the pulpit, I actually believe that. I'm sorry, God. It is worse than gossip. Because they said things about you. Now I know they were lies. And I respected those words because they came from the pulpits across the land. I'm sorry. 
God has so much forgiveness and long suffering and goodness and truth for those people that are like Moses. He's not just going to pass out forgiveness to the guilty. You have to first of all say, I'm guilty. The kind of guilt where you say, God, I've listened to the lies and I believe them. I'm sorry. Now, in the New Testament, thank goodness, we've got the apostles that could see that all of what was taking place here in the Old Testament was a picture of Christ coming to show us the glory of God. No man has seen God, but his son has come to declare him. Then when we listen, really listen, because Jesus talks about people, he says, I preach to them and they will not hear me. I don't want to be in that number. Moses is asking, show me your glory. He's put in the cleft of the rock because that's where you can hear from. You have to be on Christ, the solid rock, first to understand the words. God meant it to be this way, that we could learn, like Paul says, glory upon glory. Why do we have to learn glory upon glory? Because you couldn't handle all that God is all at once. But he has the compassion to tell you how to grow, get stronger and stronger so you could handle the glory. Why? Because if he showed you his glory all at once, you would be so angry at the world you couldn't understand how God be, could be this patient this long. when you could actually see what he's put up with. If you saw all that at once, keeping mercy for thousands. Why? Because thousands have offended God. Thousands of preachers have declared things about God that are not in Christ. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I want to have a heart like Moses. And I want to have a heart like all the prophets. God, I do. I do. I want to go speak for you. I want to be a voice. I don't care. I don't want to be famous. Actually, there's something in me that wants to be infamous. <laughs> with the religious because they're the ones that are harming the image of God. I just want to be one of those guys that says, God, okay, okay, I, I, I'm taking your word in all this time. I'm eating it. Like the, the scroll that was given to John, eat it. It'll be like honey in your mouth and bitterness in your spirit. I think I'll end it there. <laughs>